Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be with you again for this, the second installment of this year's Omnibus Lecture Series. We have an exciting lecturer in Ken Olet. I will tell you that he's charming, he's articulate, he's erudite. I'm never sure exactly what that means. But, but we're delighted to have you here tonight. Um, if you had to park and walk a distance, once again, I apologize for that. It will get better. Uh, but I saw we had a trolley out tonight, so I hope several of you took advantage of that. Um, you may be aware, and you may not, that our speakers have another audience. They meet with students, and Mr. Aletta met with one of our communications learning communities classes, a class today, and, uh, and had a wonderful time with the students. So r realize that we try to make this an educational experience throughout the university, and that's what we insist on with our omnibus lecture uh, speakers. As always, I want to thank the English Bonner Mitchell Foundation. Um, they've been with us from the beginning. Our media sponsors, Wayne TV, News Channel 15, and Northeast Indiana Public Radio. Once again, afterwards, there will be a book signing uh, and a question and answer period in the reverse order, a question and answer period, and then a book signing. And um, we have, once again, the, uh, the microphones. Uh, please keep your questions short. Um, so that as many people who want to ask questions can. I want you to know that I feel very close to the speaker tonight. He's uh, a regular columnist for the, the New Yorker. He's written a lot there, and I've been rejected by the New Yorker. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, you like to have things in common with speakers. So tonight, uh, without further introduction, let me introduce Steve Carr, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Hi, my name is Steve Carr. I'm an associate professor of communication. And before introducing tonight's speaker, Ken Aletta, a newsflash from August 31st, 1998. And I quote, here's a worldwide web search engine with a difference. It's called Google. And although it's a plain looking site, you might enjoy a visit. Mostly Google is like other search engines and it works fine that way. But it has a funny button you can click. I'm feeling lucky. In more serious searches, Google does a good job finding sites. You might want to bookmark it. The newspaper article this newspaper art article demonstrates a significant point. There's nothing particularly wrong with this account. It just doesn't get Google. For 1998, understandable. But some 12 years later, conventional wisdom hasn't changed much. You have to admire someone who feels so strongly about this point, enough to write a letter to the editor of the New York Times, criticizing the newspaper's favorable review of his recent bestseller, Googled, The End of the World as We Know It. A letter took the reviewer to task for missing a crucial point, and I'm quoting here from the letter. The book repeatedly argues that traditional media were slow to awaken to the digital revolution, and have mistakenly scapegoated Google, end quote. He then suggested that the, root, uh, to, that the writer, whose review was favorable, revisit the book's subtitle, The End of the World as We Know It. Now clearly, Aletta doesn't believe Google is gonna cause the end of the world. We might just need to learn a new media landscape, something that Aletta uh, concludes most tradi traditional media companies were quote, inexcusably slow, end quote, to do. Ken Aletta has, has written on media for the New Yorker magazine since 1992. He's the author of 11 books, including five national bestsellers. Before becoming a writer, he served in numerous roles in the Peace Corps as special assistant to the, under, uh, to the U.S. Undersecretary of Commerce in Robert F. Kennedy's 1968 pres presidential campaign helping Howard J. Samuels twice lose the race for governor of New York, and that's the letter's words, not mine. As executive director of the New York City Off-Track Betting Corporation. In 1974, he became chief political correspondent for the New York Post, then weekly columnist for the Village Voice, then contributing editor for New York Magazine. He's a regular fixture on such programs as Nightline, NewsHour with Jim Lehrer, and The Charlie Rose Show. 
He is a correspondent for one of the finest investigative journalism programs on American television today, PBS Frontline. I'm very happy to present to you the person Columbia Journalism Review has deemed America's premier media critic, concluding that, quote, no other reporter has covered the new communications revolution as thoroughly as has Canaletta. I present to you Canaletta. I want to thank you, Steve, for mentioning my checkered past. And the chancellor, you know, we ha I have a letter actually from the editor of the New Yorker who'd like to see your pieces again. Um, <laughs> you know, I I'm just a hick from New York City, and, and I've never been to your campus, um, never been in this magnificent hall before I visited this afternoon. Um, Carnegie Hall is, is, is larger, but you get nosebleed if you sit real high, you don't hear. And it was a pleasure to be here, and I, I thank you for having me. Um, Steve was talking about 1998, which is actually the place I'd like to begin my, my talk tonight. Because in 1998, I was visiting Microsoft, and I interviewed Bill Gates in his office. and. We were talking and I had my pad on. At the time, if you remember back in 98, the internet is really in its, in its adolescence. It was not yet in full flower as it is today. Um, it, people were wondering how big it might get, but they didn't really have a sense that it would be as impactful as it's become. Um, back in 98, the government was looking at whether to investigate or actually charge Microsoft with antitrust violations. Back in 98, uh, Steve Jobs and Apple had not yet made the comeback that they would. It was a different period of time, and I interviewed Bill Gates in his office, and Microsoft then was on top of the world. Um, and I said to him, Mr. Gates, I said, what's your nightmare? What's your business nightmare? What do you worry most about? And he paused, and he reached behind him and opened up a refrigerator, and he took out a Diet Coke, cost like a, a typical engineer. He didn't think to offer me one. Um, I was really thirsty and really ticked off about that. In any case, he, he, he gave a, a surprising answer, I thought. He didn't say, I'm worried, I, my nightmare is Sun Microsystems or Netscape or Apple or, or some competitor. What he said was, I worry about some guy in a garage who's inventing something I've never thought about, and that will really challenge Microsoft in a fundamental way. Well, as Steve pointed out in his introduction, back in 1998, in a garage, were the two Google guys, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. And they were inventing a technology, search, which has become much more than search today which in fact has become Microsoft's biggest nightmare, its toughest competitor that they've ever faced. If you think about Google, Google has really changed our lives. I use the phrase to, to, for the title of my book, Googled, because the world really has been Googled. We don't say, I'm going to search for something. We say, I'll Google it. And if you think about Google, if you think about what the web browser did when it was introduced in 1995, it made all the information on the internet available. But Google came along and made it accessible, made it easy to find, made it as easy to find as that remote control clicker that transformed all of our television sets. And if you go to the third world, and you go, say, to parts of Africa, nations in Africa, you will find people, schools, that can't afford textbooks. You will find countries that can't afford wired connections. They can't afford a cable connection or a, a telephone wire. But they can afford inexpensive cell phones. And in those countries, and this is true not just in Africa, it's true in many developing countries, they use those cell phones 
to do Google searches. And with Google searches, they don't have to buy textbooks, which they can't afford. Actually, Google searches become the textbook in many countries. And then if you think of the impact that Google has had on traditional media, which is partly, is a, as Steve said, a, a, a theme of my book, it has transformed and challenged everyone from television to telephone to Microsoft software to newspapers and magazines and book publishers. And I'm going to come back and circle back to that point in a moment. As a journalist, I define my job in part um, as, a, as a visitor to other planets. I basically go and I visit Planet Google. Or earlier I did a book on Wall Street. It was To me, it was Planet Wall Street or a book on poverty, and then was, it was Planet Poverty. And I try, like an anthropologist might, though I, I, I don't want to be too pretentious here, but to try and understand the natives and how, what the culture is, how they operate, what their value system is, how they got to be who they are today, and what challenges they face uh, tomorrow. And so I spent time, uh, a course of two and a half years, I spent a lot of time on planet Google. And I saw a lot of things that were interesting, I mean, the free food, which is really quite glorious food, by the way. Uh, but the five doctors on campus that give free medical help, and the free car washes and oil changes on, on Thursdays, and the m free massages, and the free laptops for anyone, a laptop of your choice, and all the wondrous things they do. But that isn't what struck me. Uh, though that's interesting. I learned a lot of things, and one of the things I, I particularly learned on planet Google, I couldn't understand how come two young men in their mid-twenties, as Sergey Brin and Larry Page were, had such clarity of thought at such a young age. How was it that they knew in 98 and 99 at a time when those in the internet world believed that what you had to do is you had to create a portal like AOL or Yahoo was doing and trap people on your portal, offer them a range of things. And if you were a search engine, and there were search engines that preceded Google, they believed that what you had to do is kind of trap people in your site. So if they do a search, take them to a, search, a site that you had um, an investment in. And the Google guy said, no, 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 we can't do that. We have to build the trust of our users. We don't want a, a portal. We're going to do a search that is really fast. So the average search today takes four-tenths of a second. From the time you press enter in that search box, four-tenths of a second later on average, you are, you've got a screen full of search results that you want. And none of them, almost none of them, have anything to do with, with Google. They also said in 2000, we have this white page, the search box page, which has very little lettering on it. And Visa comes along and they say, we will pay you $5 million if you allow us to advertise on your Google homepage. And they said, we don't want that. And the venture capitalists who would staked them to $25 million, said, you have to take it. You have no income coming in. There were no, no ads at that time on Google. In 2000, they had no income. They were just spending money. And they said, no, no, it is real important that we build user trust and we build an audience and we'll figure out, as time goes on, how to make money. And lo and behold, they had the clarity to understand that the mo one of the most important reasons for their success would be that they built consumer trust. You trusted them. It was cool. And that's real important. I learned that, but I learned something else. I learned the importance of engineers. I would sit in meetings at Google, and the engineers would speak, and I had my tape recorder, my digital recorder going, and I maybe understood half the words they spoke. I literally, it was, they were talking Swahili to me. I had no idea what they were saying. And, and literally they were talking, and I kept on thinking as I'm sitting there of the guy who replaced Steve Jobs at Apple. His name was John Scully. He was a marketing guy. And I kept on thinking, 
I'm John Scully. He didn't understand them either. That's why Apple got in trouble. But then I looked across the table, and I saw Sergey Brin, engineer, Larry Page, engineer, Eric Schmidt, the CEO, engineer. They understood every word these engineers were saying. And the engineers loved that because they had someone to talk to who understood what they were saying and could challenge them. John Scully couldn't do that. And one of the reasons that Apple faulted, I believe, technologically and lost a lot of engineers is simply because of that. I think the same thing happened with Terry Semmel and Yahoo some years, some years later. But when you, when you watch those engineers and you listen to those engineers, and I had the luxury of time to get translated for me what they were saying, what you realize, and I realize certainly, is that in the digital world, the world of the internet, the engineer is Martin Scorsese. The engineer is a content creator. If you think about this, Mark Zuckerberg, how many, how many of you have seen that movie, The Social Network, yet? Raise your hand. Very few yet. It, it's a really good movie, though it, it, it troubles me a lot because it basically is fiction. It portrays characters and uses their real names and, and doesn't represent who they really are in, in many cases. But it's a, it's a brilliant movie, I would argue. But Mark Zuckerberg, who was portrayed in the movie as a guy who's hungry to meet girls, he's had the same girlfriend since he was a sophomore, and, and, and a guy who t who's autistic and talks too fast and, and doesn't, is unsocialized, he actually talks too slow. When I interviewed him, I, it's like pulling teeth to get words out of him. And, and he looks at you, he doesn't look at the floor the way some other engineers do. In any case, Mark Zuckerberg, and I'm not glamorizing because he's got, he is, after all, an engineer. Um, I, sorry, I, could, I couldn't resist that. In any case, Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook. And if you spend, if, you're, if you or your children or grandchildren spend two hours on Facebook a day or an hour a day on Facebook, that's an hour a day you're not spending reading a book or watching CBS. Facebook is content. The engineer has transformed the meaning of what is content. Content is not just a movie or a book or a TV show. Content is, are things that occupy our time. And those engineers are crucial to sorting out and figuring out and inventing things that occupy our time. I learned something else about engineers. Engineers start with a, an attitude, which in Google's case springs from the two founders. And that attitude is the old ways of doing things are inefficient. And in fact, they often are. If you just think about 70% of the cost of most newspapers goes for paper, printing presses, and distribution. If you could eliminate them and have a paper, electronic newspaper, you save a lot of money. Now, whether you can make money and, and generate the same kind of advertising and subscription revenues you do from printed newspaper is one of the outstanding questions, and I'm going to revisit that later in this talk. But in any case, so the engineer starts with a simple question. Starts with the attitude, but then comes up with a question. And the question is, why not? Why not have an electronic newspaper that saves 70% of the cost and allows people to access information minute by minute as it's happening? And not just access information, but actually have, because of the internet platform, have a multimedia experience. They're not just reading something. They can actually watch video and listen to audio and go to the, and, and, and on the iPad with their finger tap and, and, and call up the archive of that newspaper. Isn't that cool? Think about books. Why not have electronic books? Fifth, four, roughly 40% of all the books, hardcover books that are published are returned. In order to get bookstores to carry books, publishers had to agree to take a return policy. They would take back the unsold books. They had to do that to protect the bookstores. Well, 40% of the costs of books today are returns. So if you had an electronic book, which sold more cheaply, and where authors get a larger royalty, the average royalty on a hardcover book is 15% of each of the sale, and on an electronic book, it's 30 to 40%. So 
isn't that kind of cool? Now, I'm going to come back to the impact on bookstores and on book publishing, but nevertheless, it is certainly a more efficient system. Get rid of the paper, get rid of the printing presses, get rid of the returns, get rid of the warehousing, make it more efficient. Look at music. The music companies insisted for years that they should, that you had to buy an entire CD. Oh, sorry, $16, $18, whatever it is, that's good, buy the whole thing, because the artists want you to experience the oeuvre, you know, the whole, everything they do. And along comes iTunes, Apple's iTunes, and they say, hey, 99 cents, you can buy a single digital recording. And by the way, take 25 seconds to listen to any of the songs you may want to buy for free. And if you want to buy it, just click here, and, you, and you've got it. It transforms the entire music business, and it better serves consumers, because we don't have to, we're not stuck with the business model, this decrepit business model that the music company said. Think about Microsoft, and one of the reasons why Google is a nightmare to them, they come along and they say, hey, why spend four or five hundred dollars on, on packaged Microsoft software? Why not store it in the cloud? Well, what is the cloud? The cloud is simply a server. Google has all these data centers all over the world, and they say, look, we have extra storage capacity. You know, the way you store information or retrieve information on your handheld device, it's, it's in a server. You just, and it follows you, you can access it anywhere. And let's do the same thing for Google Cloud Computing, and instead of charging you four or $500, maybe we'll charge you $50 and it'll always be available to you on any device, no matter where you are. That transforms Microsoft's business. Telephones, free telephone calls. Google's YouTube, 40% of, of all the video online comes over YouTube, which Google owns. And they say, well, why not have access to, as you have an access to a library of books, why not have access to a library of everything that's on television? or movies. You got copyright issues, and I'm going to come back again to that issue. But nevertheless, it is more efficient to think of it that way. So at the same time as the Google engineers are thinking about how to do things more efficiently and figuring out how to challenge traditional media, I, I didn't even mention advertising, which is the economic engine for much of traditional media to support them. Advertising is actually one of the most inefficient businesses imaginable. It used to be that you, would, that you would go to an ad agency and they would send you to their media buying arm and the media buying arm would charge you 4 or 5% of, of, the, of the price you, you pay for all the ads. If, that is to say, if you, if you spent 2 million, this year it's $3 million on a 30 second Super Bowl ad, you would pay 4 or 5% to the media buyer who bought that, that ad of that $3 million sum. It's a pretty hefty price. And at the same time, the advertising agency couldn't tell you how many people watched your ads, whether they liked your ad, how long they watched it for, or whether they bought your product. All of those things Google and digital companies can tell you. So they say, why go to them? Come to us. And increasingly, companies like Google are, are taking over pieces of the advertising business. So at the same time, where was the advertising business? Where was traditional media as this was happening? My argument is that by and large, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing here as I was about engineers before, but by and large, they had their head in the sand. They basically were people, they, they would say to me as I'm reporting the book, newspapers would say to me, hey, Ken, go back and look. We had an online newspaper 10 years ago. And I would, and I would, I went back and looked, and I remember as a reporter reporting on some of this, yes, they had online newspapers. But that online newspaper, the editor invariably reported to the editor of the newspaper. And the, that editor of the online newspaper was not allowed to break news until it appeared the next morning in the print newspaper. And the editor of the online news was generally someone who didn't understand that the, that the internet platform was a multimedia platform, a very different platform than a newspaper platform which comes out once in the morning, the stories never change. 
On the internet, stories change all the time. I got up at five o'clock this morning and went to the New York Times online, and I saw the, the, the lead stories in the New York Times at five o'clock. I then did some email, and I went back to the New York Times around 6.15 online. The stories had all changed. They were different stories now. And it's not only print stories, it's video. You want to watch an interview with Charlie Rose of someone you're reading about in the paper? You want to click on, on the archive? You want to listen to an NPR interview? All of that is available in this new medium, of digital medium of the internet. The other thing that, that, that traditional media fail to do is they fail to bring at a high level into their operations engineers. They fail to understand that the engineer really was the content creator and should be at the elbow of the CEO of these media companies or the editor of these media companies or publisher of these media companies, and they didn't do that. And they didn't do that in part because the mindset in too many traditional media companies was to lean back and to complain, to moan about the awful things that the that the digital world was doing to us. The evil empire that was Microsoft 10 years ago and is now the evil empire of Google today. Essentially, you were talking about people who, who saw change not as a challenge, but as a problem. And they leaned back and they tended to blame others and not blame themselves and not say, what can I do to change? I learned something else about Google and, and in contrast to, to Microsoft. When I interviewed Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer in the late 90s, I was doing a book, I wound up doing a book on Microsoft and the antitrust trial they went through in, in Washington, which I covered. Um, if you listen and you read the emails that they wrote back in the late 90s to their minions, they took glee in describing how they wanted to crush, that was a word that was used, they wanted to crush Netscape. This was not sport, this was war. And so I came away thinking of the Microsoft people as cold businessmen. I don't think Bill, Bill Gates is that way anymore, by the way. I think he's transformed as an individual. I think what he's done with the Gates Foundation, he still doesn't talk to me, by the way, for my book, but it's all right. I, you know, he's, he's not giving me, I'm not applying for any grants. But in any case, I think he's a transformed individual, and I don't think he would write the same memos today. Uh, but nevertheless, he and Bomber and some of the Microsoft people were really cold businessmen. The time I spent with Google, I didn't find them cold businessmen. I didn't find any glee that they were disrupting traditional media companies, for instance. I came to think of them as cold, not cold businessmen, but cold engineers. And the engineer, the cold engineer, is basically someone who says, how do I make something more efficient so it better serves you, the consumer? And so much of what Google does does better serve you and me. I love the fact that I have a library at my fingertips, as people in developing countries love the fact that they have Google search as a textbook. I love the fact that it's free. I remember interviewing for my book uh, the head of one of the major cable companies, and he said to me, how do we compete with Google? Everyone hates the cable, the cable guy, but Google is free. Everyone loves Google. So. When I think of Google, in the short run at least, I think they perform miraculous feats that better serve consumers. In the long run is the question, will that be true? And if you look, I mean, I worry, for instance, about how the digital world affects my world of journalism. I was in Afghanistan last spring for a story for The New Yorker uh, on media in Afghanistan. It wasn't, I wasn't doing about American media, I was doing about Afghan media and how, and the challenges it faces. And, one, and I learned that, for instance, in Afghanistan where you have 80% illiteracy, newspapers are very weak. The internet is very weak. If you can't read or write, how can you do email? You can't. So new media in a country like Afghanistan 
was old media. It was television and radio. And so I was profiling a gentleman who created the largest media uh, company in Afghanistan, television and radio. And he was, he was, he had on the air, he did a show which was patented after American Idol, and it was called Afghan Star. And on Afghan Star, which was watched by half the population of Afghanistan, 30 million people, half the people were watching this show, which is much more than anyone watches American Idol here, percentage-wise. And yet many of them don't even have TVs. They would crowd around in open areas or in homes to watch TV. And what would they see? They would see women competing in singing against men. And then you would hear, and I would interview, the fundamentalists, not Taliban. I'm talking about people who believe that it's an incorrect interpretation of Muslim law to allow a woman to sing. This gentleman who owned this had women as co-anchors with men of the news shows. They denounced that. A woman should not be talking to a man. A woman should have a burqa covering a whole face and body. You shouldn't be able to see her face on television. So that's the world I was entering. Now, who tells me about that world? Well, I, the New Yorker has done, you know, as Stephen Cole and, and others who've done amazing reports from Afghanistan. But day in and day out, the New York Times has five reporters in a country like Afghanistan. And they have about 20 stringers who they pay as well. And if you look at where the reporters for the New York Times or other BBC or others live, they are fortified by armed guards. All of that is very expensive. If newspapers die, decline, if the New York Times can't afford to make its debt payments, how do they afford what probably is four or five million dollars a year just for one country? And yet, if they die, if they don't report on that country, what happens to us? What happens to the information? The blogosphere going to supply that? I thought it was wonderful that in the Green Revolution, in Iran last year, that we could, through Facebook and Twitter, uh, we could actually learn firsthand and see pictures of what was happening on the streets of Tehran in Iran. That was fabulous. They were, they were our citizen journalists. But is that the same as having Dexter Filkins, who arguably is the best foreign correspondent in the world for the New York Times? We, giving you, knowing the language, knowing the people, knowing the history, being able to sort things out for you as your intelligent agent about what is going on, giving you context, which too often in the blogosphere you don't get that kind of context. So I, I worry about journalism. I worry about book publishing. What happens to, if in fact, today 8, eight to 10 percent of all books are sold electronically, e-books, and they project, project that in four to five years, 35% of all books will be e-books. What happens to bookstores? An e-book is sold for 12 or $13, and that the pressure to lower that price will, will increase. That same book in a bookstore, hardcover, is $26. How does that independent bookstore Many of you know the owners and proprietors and people who work in those stores. How do they compete for $26 with a $13 book? They have overhead to pay, employees to feed. It's very hard. And how do they do an e-book? It's very hard to do that and figure out how they compete. And yet, if you lose bookstores, there are 1,400 left independent bookstores. I'm not talking about the chains. I'm not talking about Walmarts but 1,400 independent bookstores. When you lose bookstores, you also lose something the publishers also care about, which is serendipity, the serendipitous purchase. You walk into a bookstore thinking of getting one book, and you suddenly pick up another, and you wind up buying it. So that accidental purchase, that serendipitous purchase, is very important to the book business. Think about music. What happens, I mean, I understand you know, you, abstractly, no one likes the idea, at least, of, of, of piracy in music, of people illegally downloading music, and yet we know it goes on rampantly. But what happens to the, per the musician 
who says, hey, how can I afford to be a musician when I'm not paid for my work? Well, then they say, well, then you go out, which is what they've been doing in the music business, go out on the road and do concerts. But that's a business that seems to be drying up now as well. So you have real questions. Who's going to produce the content if they're not paid for it? I had a wonderful exchange at one point, which I tell in my book with Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google. He came in for our second interview. He, he rollerblades into his meetings, honest. And, and um, you wouldn't expect that of an engineer, right? And I'm making fun of engineers. I really revere them. Uh, I just don't want to have dinner with them. But, but he rollerblades into the meeting, and he drops his knapsack down. He says, Ken, before you begin, let me ask you a question. I said, what's that? He said, why don't you publish your book for free on the Internet? You'll get many more readers. It'll be free. It'll be great. I said, yeah, that's interesting. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, I'm on a leave of absence from The New Yorker to do this book. And I've made 13 trips out here, each of seven to 10 days duration, pay for a rented car, pay for a hotel, pay for the meals. When I'm taking people out as a journalist, I can't let them pay for me. Who's gonna pay me a salary? He says, oh. I said, let me ask you another question, Sergey. I said, who's gonna edit my book? Oh, I said, who's going to do my book promotion tour? Oh, who's going to do my index for my book? Who's going to legally vet? Oh, 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 oh. Wants to change the subject at that point. So what I learned from that? I learned, and this goes back to my cold engineer rather than cold businessman point. Sergey Brin is a young man who's lived, he knows one thing brilliantly. He knows Google brilliantly, and he knows the digital world brilliantly. So it's not just Google it, one thing he knows, but he knows more than that. But he doesn't know about the world of publishing. He doesn't know about the world of copyrights, the world of privacy. And so suddenly I'm confronting him with real, ans real questions, real answers to, to his naivete. And so I think he's kind of taken back by that. But it also tells you something else. It tells you that, that he, like a lot of people in Silicon Valley, grew up with the notion that information should be free and available to everyone. That's why they decided in 2003 to digitize all the world's 25 million books. Wouldn't it be cool, they said, if everyone had access to every book ever published? Well, it really would be cool. I love the idea. It's great for us. It's great for consumers that any book, even books that are out of print, would be back available to all of us. And that's wonderful. On the other hand, is it there? Can they just take that book? What about copyright? Can they just post anything they want and make copies of it? And, may, and, and therefore increase the chances of piracy for that book, the kind of piracy we've had in the music business? Well, of course they could. So what happened? The publishers sued them. And eventually, Google did something that's very significant, which segues to my next point. Google settled that lawsuit against the publishers and the Authors Guild by agreeing to pay $125 million for the copyright, the right rewarding people for their copyright and giving them the right to digitize books and giving them a percentage of the sale of future books. That was a very significant admission on Google's part and, and a really important transition for them and for the digital world. Because they're really saying that information is not free. That, pe that, 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 that people who have a copyright, that people who produce the content should be able to make a living on that content. It's their work. And so when you start, when you spin forward and you think about, well, where is the world going? What is going to happen to the digital companies like Google on the one hand, so-called new media companies, and on the other hand, the old media companies, be they the networks or the newspapers or the book publishers or the telephone companies or the advertising agencies or the movie studios, what's going to happen to them in this digital world? And I think what's happening now, and you see it today, with the Apple iPad. Apple suddenly is welcoming people to create applications. They call them apps for the iPad or the iPhone. And, and everyone is rushing to do that. The New Yorker has rushed to create an app a subscription for the New Yorker Online, which offers things that are not 
in the New York, it's multimedia. It offers things that are not just in the print edition. You can see other cartoons. You can go to Cartoon Bank. You can, you, you can see other things. The New York Times, the same thing. The Wall Street Journal, the same thing. Vanity Fair, the same thing. But book publishers, the same thing. And what's happening, I think, is that the, the digital world, because of the recession we all experienced, starting a year and a half, two years ago, they came to realize, companies like Google and others, came to realize that advertising was a very slender read to lean on, and they needed to create another source of income. For instance, if you think about YouTube, Google's YouTube, YouTube they purchased for $1.6 billion in 2006, yet it lost money every year after that, and last year, 2009, YouTube, which produces 40% of all the videos online. It's humongous. But YouTube last year was projected to lose a half a billion dollars. A half a billion dollars. Google was staying with it because it said, like they said with search, we'll figure out a way to monetize it. How have they figured out how to monetize it? This year, for the first time, YouTube will make a small profit and it's on a trajectory to make a lot more. Why? Because Google came to realize that the engineer didn't understand advertising. They didn't understand that the advertiser would want to know, have predictable places to place their ads. They didn't want to put their ads next to a, a user-generated content of, of some guy's dog pooping on the street, right? They wanted familiar, they wanted safe, a safe harbor. And Google realized that. So Google says, well, in order to do that, we need more professional content. You can buy movies, pay-per-view on, on YouTube today. And I predict that within a couple of years, YouTube's major competitor will be Netflix. They're coming right at them. Because they realize that if you want to have advertising, and you want to have not just advertising, but another source of revenue, you need a subscription model as well. So at the same time, companies like Google or companies like Apple are realizing they need multiple sources of income. Apple has it now. Apple's getting big into the advertising business with the iPhone. And they bought a, 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 a digital advertising company in order to create ads for the iPhone. And they already sell apps, which they get a piece of, and they sell the hardware, which they get a, they get a piece of. So at the same time as digital companies are saying we need more content, old media companies are saying we need to figure out a way to charge for our content online. They're coming much closer together. Now what we don't know is whether when they come together, as they are doing, it will work. We don't know when the New York Times introduces a paywall that you can only read the Times if you're online if you subscribe to the New York Times. We don't know whether they'll be able to make money doing that. The Wall Street Journal makes money doing that. The Financial Times makes money doing that. But they are publications whose business audience, in many cases, can write off that as a business expense. So we don't know whether that's going to work to help save newspapers. We don't know whether the publishers move to, to insist that Amazon, that they can control the price of electronic books which they compelled Amazon to do when, when the iPad came along and uh, was announced in late January. Will that work? Will they be able to maintain a, a healthy enough price uh, to work? Will you be able to sell ads in the digital world that, that, make up for the, for the, that make enough income to make up for the lost income you get in subscribers and advertising in the print world? And just to highlight that fact quickly, the average reader of the New York Times spends 34 minutes online with the New York Times. The average reader of the New York Times in print spends 35 minutes on the New York Times. You say it's only a minute difference. Not true. The difference is the, the reader of the online New York Times spends 34 minutes a month with the New York Times. The average reader of the New York Times newspaper spends 35 minutes a day. Now what that means is that the advertiser says, it's not worth it for me to spend the same amount, 
to pay the same amount for an ad online as I pay for an ad in the newspaper. So an online ad generally generates only about 10% of the income for that same ad in a newspaper. So you may save 70% of your costs, production costs, if you go online. But will you generate enough income to make up the difference of lower ad prices and lower subscription rates? Those are some of the questions we don't know and can't know the answer to. But we know this. We know that the Google guys, like a lot of people in the digital world, have grown up. They've come to realize, or if they haven't realized, certainly I tried to help them realize it by what I wrote in my book, that the, the, the vice of an engineer is also their virtue. The virtue is they look for efficiencies and they're brilliant at figuring them out. The vice is that they often, often lack emotional intelligence. They don't understand what an advertiser wants with an ad, which is the mistake they made at, at, at YouTube. They don't understand why someone would be concerned about copyright, which is the mistake they made with publishers and with newspapers. They don't understand why someone would be concerned about their privacy because of street view, cameras going on, on every street all around the world. And they don't understand something that Bill Gates didn't understand in 98, that government is the 800-pound gorilla. And government has legitimate concerns in protecting all of us on issues like privacy or copyright or market share, market domination, monopoly issues. How all this plays out, and it's not just the American government we're talking about, we're talking about the government of China or Iran or, or, or the European Union, et cetera. How all this plays out, we don't know. And anyone who stands up here the way I am and pretends like some guy on a cable talk show. Let me tell you what the future is. Arrest that guy, <laughs> really, because no one knows. But this we do know. We know that what is different about the time we are living in is the velocity of change. I mean, just think about it. It took electricity seven decades to reach 50% of the American public. It took the telephone five decades to reach 50% of the American public. It took television three decades. It took the internet nine years. It took Facebook five years to reach 550 million users. That velocity is extraordinary. And I didn't interview a media person or any person in any business who, if you scratch deeply enough, when you go back for that second and third interview, which, you, which if you have a luxury of time, as I do for a book, you can do. I didn't interview one person who wasn't scared. And by the way, it's healthy to be scared. But I learned something else, and it goes back to what I said before about the mistakes of traditional media companies. I learned there are two types of people in this world. There are people who lean back. Oh, woe is me. They tend to be pessimistic. They tend to blame others. And there are people who lean forward. And they lean forward and they say, this is not a problem. This is an opportunity. Let us figure out how we can ride and surf the digital wave rather than crashing into it. Let me leave you with a final thought, and it's one expressed by Albert Camus, the great French writer and resistance fighter in World War II. He wrote once that a good hope is better than a bad holding. Not a bad thought to leave you with. Thank you. We have microphones, if, if you just step to the microphone and identify yourself and love to hear your questions. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um,
That means you don't tweet. That's good. You know, your, your provocative question brings me back to uh, that famous scene of Lyndon Johnson um, in 68 when he was watching the evening news, Walter Cronkite. And Walter Cronkite basically condemned the Vietnam War as unwinnable. And Johnson said to an aide, we just lost the war because we lost Walter. Walter Cronkite was a common hearth for all of us to get our information. That world is over. There, there is no common source of, income, source of information. One of the worries that I have, and I'm going to give you the other side of the argument too, because I think, as F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, that two, sometimes the mark of an intelligent person is the ability to keep two or more thoughts, disparate thoughts in mind at the same time and still function. And I'm not accusing myself of being intelligent, but I do think that, that, that things are complicated. But one of the worries I have about journalism, which carries on from my point about New York Times and Afghanistan and, and how expensive it is to cover the world or cover state capitals or do investigative reporting, which is all vital to us as citizens, is that as the audience bifurcates and splits, Increasingly, you see happening what's happened on Fox News or MSNBC. People say, we need to have an identity. So Fox says, we are the conservative network, in effect. They, they won't admit that, but that's, that's who they are. And MSNBC is a liberal network. They won't admit that, but that's who they are. And so they're creating a niche, a successful niche, very small niche, by the way. Fox has roughly an average of two million viewers in the evening. O'Reilly has three million. He has more. Uh, but you know, and, and MSNBC is half that. But, and, and whereas the evening newscasts are roughly 24, the three newscasts, 24 million every night at 6.30, shrinking dramatically, by the way. And so inevitably, people are not getting a common source of information. And, and inevitably, people don't trust journalists, which is partly journalists' fault. You know, the wise guy stuff. I mean, you watch someone on cable bloviating. How are you gonna trust that? Is that a journalist? public thinks he or she is a journalist. I would argue Bill O'Reilly's not a journalist, but he would argue with me and claim that he is. In any case, people increasingly come to see journalists as very opinionated, as not fair-minded, and, and, and not concerned about things like privacy, blah, 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 blah. So, and, and oftentimes associated with bad news, which inevitably we have to be. And so, we're not popular, and that further chases people away. We don't have the trust that Walter Cronkite had. Switch to the other side of my argument. If you go on Facebook, you can create communities of, of friends. You decide who you want to friend, and you can keep in touch and, and in fact, find people you went to high school with and, and, and keep and have a regular in touch with them. So there are, there are communities that are formed around sites, social networks, like Facebook. On the other hand, Facebook is a narrowing of community, generally. You may be pleased with that community, but it's not a universal community. And, and that's worrisome. Yes? Hi, um, actually, I got a very similar question, uh, but the other side of it. Um, when you're on Google and you send emails, uh, Google keyword searches your emails so they know if you're interested in buying motorcycles or sports, and they start giving you advertisements and actually having popular news stories come up that they think is tailor-made to your interests. But what it ends up doing is creating a bubble 
that your reality, the world that you think, just becomes self-selected, not because you're choosing it, but because Google assumes that you want that, and they start then feeding you information they think you like. And very quickly, your reality and your world shrinks, not by choice, but just by happenstance. That serendipity you talked about with bookstores, it doesn't exist. So how can we go into the future and how can we have Google that continues to try to make money, uh, be kind of the cold engineers, yet at the same time allow room for this serendipity that we can still feel like we're interacting, going through page one to 12 in the New York Times? A, a true story. I, I had, um, uh, in 1995, I was interviewing in Dallas before the American Society of Newspaper Editors, Andy Grove, who was the CEO and chairman of Intel. Brilliant man. There were a thousand newspaper editors from around the country in the audience. And Andy Grove loves to be devilish. He loves to be provocative. So I said, Mr. Grove, in the future, in 95, the internet really began in, uh, in popular form, consumer form, in 91. So it's just coming on. People are talking about it. It wasn't as big as it was in 98. And 98, as I said earlier, wasn't, wasn't very big either. But there was a sense of dread in that something is changing here. What is it? So I said, Mr. Grove, I said, in the future, what's the value of these thousand editors in this room? And without missing a beat, he said, zero. I don't need them. What do I need them? I don't need, he said, an intelligent agent to tell me what to watch. With the internet, I can watch anything I want, anytime I want, on, and I can choose what I want. I'll create my own Andy Grove online newspaper. And every day we push to me subjects I'm interested in. Health, I'm interested in health. I'm interested in sports, I'm interested in business. Those are, that's what I want. I don't want that other crap that these elitists think I want. Switch forward three years. At another forum, I'm interviewing Mr. Grove, and I read him his quote from 95. I said, Mr. Grove, do you still agree with yourself? And without missing a beat, he said, I was totally wrong. I said, why? He said, because I didn't understand, and this is the word he used, the power of serendipity. I didn't understand when I said that, that I, as a citizen, would need to know about things that hadn't happened yet like Rwanda, like Serbia. I didn't understand that the internet was a blizzard of information, too much information. And I needed, in fact, an intelligent agent to help me sort it all out. That is actually, when you think about it, one of the more hopeful stories I could impart to you. Because he was really saying he needs smart editors and people who are curators of information who provide context and sort out what belongs on the front page of your newspaper. Do you need as a citizen to know about Rwanda or not? And, and I, 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 that story always stays with me is it, and it's my way of answering your question. Thank you. Yes. So that, and this winds up being sort of a follow-up question uh, and I just wanted to ask you directly your opinion. Do you think the uh, traditional business model of the newspaper and, and magazine if we've known it for the last 150 years is, is dying or dead and uh, it must evolve into something else? It is evolving into something else. I mean, uh, every, every publication, because the, any publication is digital and they all have to be digital uh, in some f form, uh, will have to be multimedia. Um, and if it doesn't have an archive and doesn't have video and audio and, and, um, and ever-changing news as it's happening uh, and available on any device you have, you, you're going to flunk the test digitally. The, the question becomes, the business, is a business question, which is let's assume that the figures are right, that in five years or four years, roughly 35% of all books are e-books. Right? And let's assume that newspapers, let's say, for the sake of argument, 50% of newspapers become, 50% of newspaper readers access the, the newspaper digitally in X number of years. It won't be five, it'll be longer than that. Then the question becomes, that other 50% of newspaper readers, or that other 65% of book readers, still want to have their hardcover book. So you have the same costs 
or largely the same cost, you'll have somewhat lower returns, to, to print and distribute and warehouse and pay for returns on that book. And the same costs, roughly 70%, to produce that newspaper. Will the income you generate from the digital compensate for the income you've lost on the newspaper or the hardcover book? We don't know the answer to that yet. But that's the business question, and that's really the math question. Yes? Um, you mentioned in your speech about how very few people, if they, re if they read, um, I believe it was the uh, New York Times, they read it online, they briefly spend you know, just a couple of minutes every month, yet if you're an actual reader of it in hard copy, you spend many minutes of it in a day. If newspapers are becoming almost extinct and they're becoming more electronic, and there are very few people that actually spend a lot of time with newspapers online anyway, where is there really any drive to become a journalist? Where's the what? Is there any really drive to become a journalist then? Is there any, I didn't make out that word. Drive. Drive for the journalists. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> he asked if there was any drive to become a journalist. Wait, well, one person. Where is the drive for? Ah. Oh, you really asked a hard question. <laughs> I was trying to avoid it. The, um, I, I, you know, when, when you talk to, I mean, today when I was in, in class talking to to some students, and I see one of them behind you, who's in the class. And, and the question, what, what do you do as a, if you want to be a journalist, what, what should you do? And because you, you see opportunities in newspapers and magazines shrinking, television shrinking, radio shrinking, and the internet growing, but they don't pay the way newspapers and the other media did. So what do you do as a journalist? I think journalism is a calling. I think it's a profession, and I think journalists are, we don't get a, a, a degree like a lawyer does or a certificate like a doctor does, but I think we're supposed to be trusted to give you the best information we can and make professional judgments about whether that information is fair, balanced, you have the right sources, et cetera. So, but I think one of the things that young people who want to be journalists have to do, and hopefully they'll still feel it's a calling, is, is to be trained in multimedia. They can't just think of themselves as a print reporter. Yes, it's important to be able to write well, and it's important to be able to report well. And it's important to have a personality that people want to talk to you. I mean, if you have a personality that, that it's like going to, visiting with you is like going to the dentist and they're drilling your teeth, you know, people are not going to open up to you. But I think you've got to learn how to, how to alone to take photographs or, or video at the same time as you're taking notes or recording. And you have to know how to uplink your stories. You just have to be multimedia trained. And increasingly, journalism schools are training their, their reporters to be in multimedia, and I think that's a good thing. But I think one of the questions is whether, I think you can make an argument that, that, that after Woodward and Bernstein and Watergate, journalism became too glamorized. And, and people wanted to have this idea, you know, we'll bring down governments, we'll, we'll become Woodstein, we'll become, you know, like them. And, and a lot of journalism is grunt work. But it's really important work. The person who's covering your state capital, or the person who's doing investigative report on corruption, or fundraising in politics, they're doing really important work that help us as citizens make decisions in a democracy. And it may not be glamorous, but it is important. And they have to feel that sense of importance. But then they have to understand the way the business is changing and, and make sure that they are attuned to that. I'm a regular reader of the print version of The New Yorker, and I always enjoy your columns. Thank you. I also work uh, at the public library here in Fort Wayne, and given all you've said about books, electronic books, information at people's fingertips, if you were in my shoes, would you be nervous about your career choice? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and let me tell you why. Um, and, and it's actually, there's a larger point here. Every business has to ask themselves, every profession has to ask themselves, am I a superfluous middleman? With Google, 
the question for the librarian is, what do I need a librarian for if I could Google my information? If I'm a travel agent, I, I, as a customer, I say, why do I need a, why do I have to pay $25 fee to the travel agent when I can go to Expedia and buy my tickets without paying a fee? Why do I have to pay a real estate agent a several percent or more when I can go online and look at the, not only look at the apartments and every feature of that apartment, but see what comparable apartments sold for in the same building or the same neighborhood for houses. So the question that everyone has to ask themselves is what is the value I add that the digital world can't match? And there are some things librarians can come back and say, Google, you can't match me. You know, when you think about it, Mr. Google, your search is terribly inefficient in the name of efficiency. When I do a search and I get back 10,000 results, that's useless for me. I don't get past that first screen. And yet there may be some valuable information on screen two, three, or four, which I'm never seeing. It's too much information. It's like the Andy Grove problem. I, it's a blizzard of information. I need a curator to help me sort out what's important here. A librarian is a curator, a good librarian. Just as a good bookstore salesperson is a good curator. Travel agent, when I am traveling economy class, I use a travel agent. I pay that $25. Why? Because that travel agent can get me a bulkhead or an exit row seat where I can take out my laptop and work. And Expedia and online can't do that for me. You have to do it, wait till you get to the airport to see if you can get those seats, and often you can't. So that's the value that my travel agent provides me that the digital world doesn't. All of us have to ask that question. What is the value we add that these guys can't match? And these guys are good. But the weakness, again, of the engineer is, is, also, is their virtue, but it's their weakness, which is they, they tend not to be as strong at, at, at things like emotional intelligence and understanding things that they can't measure. Judgment you can't measure. Do you think that even though Google has participated in New Age media, it's sort of missed the mark and the opportunity to participate in social networking sites like Twitter and Facebook? Yes. Um, I think if you, when you scratch the Google team, as I did, what they're really worried about, they're worried about a number of things in the future. And, and one of the reasons they're a great company is that they do worry. They're not complacent at all. Um, but they are worried that social networks can displace them and displace them in search. If you think about it, if I'm doing a search and I, I see a camera I might want to buy, let's say it's a Sony camera, and I go on Google and I put in the name of the camera and I get back 20,000 results. What, what, my eyes are wide. I mean, what do I do with that? But if I go on Facebook and I friend, I go to my friends and I say, does anyone know the, this Sony camera? And I get back a dozen responses from people I know whose judgment I trust. Hey, that, can, that is a fabulous camera. I bought it two months ago. I use it every day. Let me tell you the features I love. And you get an echo chamber of people who say that or say the opposite. We don't like it. That is a really efficient and menacing search for Google. And Google knows that, which is why last year they tried to buy Twitter and failed. And, and, but social networks are, are, are rival Google the way Google now increasingly is rivaling Apple. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I didn't see you. I apologize. Black shirt. Um, you mentioned how uh, news outlets are always looking for ways to save money. Um, do you foresee ever a day when the newsroom will be virtual? There'll be no one in a physical building where everyone will just telecommute and communicate that way? Uh, it'd be very lonely. One of the great things about newsrooms is, is, is that camaraderie and the, and, and the sparking of ideas and, and sharing of information. But increasingly, newsrooms will become more and more desolate, and they will be, uh, you know, it's like distance learning. I mean, there'll be people, 
operating without going to the office. I mean, I, for instance, file my stories for the New Yorker online. I mean, I just send in an email attachment. And I go into the office and I talk to people. And, and, but essentially, I'm not carrying a, mag, a manuscript to the office anymore. And I get back the edits with annotations on the side so I can see the changes that the editor has worked on. In fact, I have to work on one. I have to go back at 7 in the morning to New York because I have to get edits back. But I have it, literally an annotated copy on my, on my laptop. And so it's very efficient to do that. And I like that virtual world. Um, on the other hand, I don't like the fact that, that people will not be in a newsroom, not sharing. And one of the things that's different about the digital, the, the blogosphere, or much of the blogosphere, and, and, and journalism that I'm extolling for you, journalism is a team effort. It's not an individual effort. The blogosphere, a blogger is an individual, generally speaking, who is writing, oftentimes very knowledgeably, maybe ex with great expertise about a subject. But he or she is not working with a team of people who are working to try and make that journalism better. Hey, Ken, we think you buried your lead. Your lead is really on page 12 of your or your draft. But Ken, I think you got to go back and get more information from this person. Ken, I don't know you're being fair to, the, to this person you wrote about here. It's, it's people who are constantly challenging you, and that's true in newspapers or magazines. I have fact checkers at the New Yorker. New Yorker does an unusual amount of fact checking, and most publications don't do the kind of extensive fact checking the New Yorker does. When I hand in a story, I hand in all of my notebooks, all of my digital recordings, anyone I've talked to, they listen to the tapes of those interviews and confirm that what I wrote on the page conforms to what the recording says. And they check everything. And they're working to make my reporting and my journalism and my writing better. And, and I think we lose that teamwork when you go to a virtual, the more you go to a virtual newsroom. Ken, I've got the information that I'm the last. First of all, I want to make an observation. I really want to thank you for being here. And you speak a hell of a lot better than you write. <laughs> now, I'm going to let me, let, let me explain that, okay? No, no, I'm leaving now. It's no, okay. No, 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 no. I want to explain that. Because you know what? I can read your heart. I can watch your eyes. I can watch your body language. I can, I can receive when you speak all of the emotion that you put into that. And to me, that's very, very important, and I thank you for that. You also include that in your writings, too, but I really got a flavor here tonight. My question is this, because I wasn't going to ask a question, but, but you talked about... I didn't think you were going to ask a question either. Yeah, you, yeah. you talked about Scully and Jobs and Wozniak, and you talked about the business person versus the engineer. And one of the things that I think about is, if I'm sitting here as an engineer, what I want from that business person is respect, hope, trust those kinds of ingredients, and an honest relationship. As I understand some of the relationships there with Mr. Scully, there might have been some things from outside the job that affected that engineer's ability to look at him with trust and respect and honesty. Not only did he not understand the engineering language, and I, you know, I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. Or uh, I, I don't know enough about um... Scully, uh, whether there were other issues, I literally don't know. Um, and if there were salacious stuff that I couldn't prove, I wouldn't share it, but I, I literally don't know anything about that. Um, I, I know that he was a guy who came from Pepsi-Cola, and he was a marketing guy. And, and he decided after a year of being Steve Jobs' partner, Steve Jobs recruited him, he decided in the mid-80s, and he decided that Steve Jobs was a micromanager, and Steve Jobs wasn't focused, he was just focused on things that possessed him at that moment. The truth is, he was probably right about that. Steve Jobs, in his second act, is very, a very different guy than he was in his first act. He learned an awful lot about being the great executive he is today, the great, he's a genius. And, and he's not a pleasant guy, but he's a genius. And, and who cares if he's not a pleasant guy? He's a genius. He's Thomas Edison for us. And so, but I think one of the things that happens as you go through life's experiences, you find, A, the people do have second and third acts, but you never think they would. Steve Jobs never thought he would come back. 
That's right. And anyway, he came back. Richard Nixon never thought he would come back. Hillary Clinton never thought she would come back. People come back all the time. And oftentimes they come back in a different form, chastened by the things they've learned. And, and that's wonderful. And, and we live in a society where, unlike many others, where, where if you make a mistake, you're condemned. You know, Cultural Revolution in China, you're condemned. You're dead. Okay? We're not condemned. People have second, third acts. That's really cool. And I'm glad you saw, and I thank you for seeing some passion. And I'll tell my wife that you don't think I can write. <laughs> thank you all.